I'm just going to, um, in all respect, uh, just say how great it is to be here. But I'm the Dean of Ministry at St. Melitus College. <laughs> and it's, it's been that long since we've known each other, um, obviously. But it's so good to be here and to be amongst old friends, because I recognize a few faces, and what I hope will become new friends as well. A lot of what we do is relational. A lot of what we do as the church in terms of our call to the world and our intention to follow Jesus is about who we are and how the Spirit of God inhabits that. So, I begin with this. In this cavernous building, which had been a part of his memories since he was a child, and the backdrop of the dreams and visions of a new life throughout his formative years was hope. At last he had come home to his mother church. This was as much a place for him as anyone else. Part of the narrative of his story, writ large in white stone, in marble, in stained glass, and in wood, was about him. This place was familiar and yet new. He was both pilgrim and sojourner. I come from a culture where narrative exposition is integral to the way of understanding life. Story is about what it means to be in community with others. And it's also a part of the theological endeavor of listening to God and speaking God to one another. So I make no apologies for beginning this talk with a, an excerpt from a story about Raimundo Ellis by Teresa Simpson. It's a fictionalized account of a young man who after arriving at Tilbury Brock, Brock Docks from the Caribbean in 1948, makes his way to London. And the first thing that he wants to do is to go to St. Paul's Cathedral. So the description I started with at the beginning was his sense of coming home. He had heard about St. Paul's, he knew of St. Paul's, and he felt he wanted to come and connect with the building, with the land it was on, because it was part of his identity. And really, this talk this morning is around reparation, restoration, and resolution, but I want to slightly use a different angle, because reparation isn't about the usual way we think about it in terms of financial recompense. It is that and more, but it is also about recognizing and remedying the fact that everybody's stories are interconnected. Might be um, through history and time and, and everything like that, but the people that are in this place, we that are in this place at this time, our stories are interconnected. And so my attempt very briefly, is to answer the questions, how can the cathedral, the cathedral be a place of re-envisioning, of being a, a conduit for racial reconciliation, and where the principles of reparation are embodied and lived out, both in a local sense with those that it purports to serve and in a national sense? How can we be involved and be practically minded? What is God calling us to discern at this point in time? As the story alluded to, there's something about metaphor and meaning and the embodiment of being in place and time. And one of the complex associations of churches and cathedrals, the places, that we all know about and that we sometimes find it difficult to talk about are the memorials that are enshrined within its walls, 
within its context. So how do we navigate some of that hereditary that's often in front of our faces? I think we have to do this together because it concerns not just the descendants of those like myself from enslaved people, but the descendants who have benefited from the enslavement of people. It concerns the fortunes and the money and the resources that were made from the metal that went into the leg, hand, neck and mouth irons and the guns that were traded for black and brown bodies. The colonial artifacts that have crossed Europe and have resulted in great wealth. And what this means is, as I continue to talk to my brothers and sisters, it means having a truthful, courageous conversations that cannot be avoided. And a truthful, courageous conversation often brings about a truthful, repentant narrative of not just the past, but where we should be going in the future. It has to include the whole thing, warts and all. It has to live with the discomfort of what it means to be in a society where structurally whiteness and superiority are part and parcel of the fabric of what we live in. Our vocabulary has changed over the last 25 years. And so terms such as white supremacy, white superiority, structural racism, gaslighting, all those terms, it's incumbent on us to start to learn the language in order to converse. I know it's difficult. I know it feels challenging. But if we are to come to a place of reconciliation, we must begin the conversation. So the visual representations of place invite reflections on identity. And just because those identities are not always obvious, not always apparent, they are nevertheless, they're there. Many years ago, I um, saw a picture of uh, a beautiful carved head at Salisbury Cathedral, uh, and one of the chapels. And I looked at this picture and I thought, that is a picture of a person from Africa. And, and I, actually, it was a stone carving. And I didn't realize that it was acknowledged that one of the stone masons at the time had actually carved this. And what it did for me seeing that was it enabled me to think, I am part of this. My ancestors were part of this, and therefore I have some ownership in this place. And it's so important for people to feel that. So the whole story is something that's so vital, so important. The biblical notion of reparation has been spoken about in quite at length. And I just want to talk about it in terms of the idea of compensation for damage. We find it in Exodus where if an individual hurts another individual, even though they're part of a household uh, of service, of servitude, if an individual is hurt in Exodus, then the owner owes them recompense. And that's just for things like losing or being hit, losing a tooth or being hit. The Hebrew scripture talks about they must be recompensed for this. So there was recognition not only of the value, and, and of course I'm not speaking about the social context in relation to justifying slavery or enslaved people. I'm talking about the recognition that anything that's done to a human body requires some sort of recompense. When we come to stories such as Zacchaeus, 
and the liberation of being encountering the living Lord Jesus. Zacchaeus immediately wants to repay those that he has wronged, not just like for like, but more so. And so the precedence in the Bible in relation to the financial recompense is there. But I would argue not just a financial exchange, it's about an acknowledgement, an acknowledgement that things have gone wrong, that there is a need to look at things in a different way. There is a need for us to understand that in order to enter into the conversation, a truthful discourse has to happen. So how can, we, how can cathedrals witness to and understand and be involved? I think we must clarify by what we mean by reparation. From a legal perspective, effective reparation amounts to restitution, as I've alluded to before, and compensation. But it also means rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantees of non-repetition. It requires all of these elements together. If only some are put in place, then it is not true reparation. It is not true repentance. It requires a commitment on the behalf of those that have been um, benefited to those that have lost. Kwon and Thompson talk about reparation in terms of a theft of memory, a theft of body, a theft of potential, a theft of human dignity. And when we talk about the whole history of enslavement, it is that. It is a theft of potential for the future. I put this picture up because, as um, certainly Azariah may recognize, it's a church from my own history. My mother comes from an island in Nevis, um, from, from the Caribbean, an island called Nevis. And this is a church called St. Thomas's Anglican Church that sits on a hill um, above where my, my mother comes from. And this church was built around 1643. And I did not appreciate that my family had visited, had worshipped at that church over that time. And so the association with place, as I spoke about, is very real. It's very tangible. Place and association are things that people feel keenly. And so when we talk about understanding what memorials stand for, we're talking about what does it say to those people that come into that place, come into that space? who have a story, who have a history, who want to be able to encounter and talk and interact with their history, with the history that they have come across. I think it's important to acknowledge that before we even begin to seek some means of addressing. Marcus Bolkanov, who is a, an academic, he works on an area called autochmony. Now, autochmony is one of these really weird words that talks about the quality of belonging to or being connected with a certain place or region by virtue. And it's really useful for me in helping to understand the significance of buildings, of churches, of memorials, of other places, and why there is a need to attend to the work of reparation before reconciliation. In exploring notions of identity, Balkenhol looks at those people who have migrated from the Dutch Caribbean, who settled in the Netherlands, and he found from listening to them that people articulated that they were increasingly feeling disenfranchised from their seminal places, their places where they associated their identity with. The dissonance that they felt was as a result of the same thing that the fictional Raimundo 
um, came across, the reality of what they saw, what they experienced, with the images that they had in their heads. The history of black presence is often couched and very complex, couched in narrative and story, but is often complicated by the reception of others. And this others, this ulteriority, ulteriority is something that comes and belongs to othering. And you can see in a phenomenological sense, the experience of community can be misshaped because when people come to a place, their experience isn't acknowledged, their history isn't acknowledged. And so the sense of belonging and identity with that place is eroded. Similarly, the work of Ajahn Apajurai, looking at place and belonging, highlights that through remembering, that is an essential part of reparation. And as oceanic and global dysphoric communities start to think about what does it mean for me to be here, they start to make connections to what does the God who has created me in this place at this time say to me through the relationships of others? But it's about, about recognizing the damage that has been done historically that is often missing. And in order for us to be truly reconciled, that has to be recognized. So, in terms of the work of reparation, restoration and resolution, as disciples of Christ, it's part of our vocational identity. Healing, forgiveness, acknowledgement of sin, because that's what racism is, it's a sin. Structural sin, personal sin, relational sin, cultural sin, is about acknowledging that. And so our vocational identity as followers of Christ means having conversations about that. But more than that, moving to action. It's part of our understanding that our missional integrity is about realizing that. Not about being paralyzed to the extent where we can't do anything about it. And we're like the proverbial um, bird that sticks its head in a hole. What we start to do is say, what, Lord, are you asking me to do with my sisters and my brothers? What is the cost that is in that doing? It is about this transformational activity. Restitution is more than saying I'm sorry, but extends to correcting the wrong as fully as possible and recovering the truth. That is so hard sometimes, but if we don't start, we will never, never address it. The eschatological reality is that one day we will see, as Roger said in Revelation 7 and 9, every tribe and tongue. But that doesn't stop us trying to get there. It doesn't stop us having the repentant, truthful, courageous conversation. It doesn't stop us acknowledging the sin of what has gone wrong. In fact, it's the opposite we are impelled to continue doing that, acknowledging and making address. I am very much into, as the dean uh, of a college, what is our vocational identity as a college, as an organizational a structure, as a community of learning and education, and as individuals. And I keep going back to this sense of what it is to be a beloved community. That Martin Luther King spoke about, but also Howard Thurman, 
what it is to inhabit that way of being that knows that you are personally loved and therefore that shapes your relationship with other people and then that extends outwards and touches the structure and organization. And in Quanon Thompson's book, A Call, A Christian Call for Repentance and Repair, they say this, the beloved church is also a community commission for the work of love in the midst of the world. It could not be otherwise. For that which indwells God's people is the love of the manger, the foot basin and the cross. And so that love must in accordance with its nature be shared, be given and be spent. Spending love, giving it away is costly. It is looking at ourselves and how we may be perceived and it's going out of the way to make others and their perception become part of a much more wider collective narrative. Lee says this, historically the human race has mastered the art of absolute exclusion so much to the extent that the other is completely foreign to the self. The structural divides that we put in place based on race and gender, on all other characteristics, seek to push away rather than to come and embrace. And Mirosaf Valve writes, because all humans are inescapably and intrinsically intertwined, we are at the same time, both in distance and in belonging, connected to one another. So to completely exclude is to mar oneself. This dual aspect calls for the dual work of embrace and to examine that exclusion as well. In order for this work to progress, we have to do the work in order for that to happen. I want to, oh, just let me go back a bit before I go on that talk about missional um, conviction and identity. So we talk about this in kind of conceptual terms, but what does it mean in practice? It means in practice looking at our places around us. It means in not just representation on a superficial level, but it means on being earnest about incorporating in who we are, in our worship, in our ways of being, the reality of it. That is difficult. And I, I don't know if, um, I'm looking at my colleagues at the back, if you can make sure the sound is on. But this is from the, um, the church service at the Wash Washington National Cathedral. Now, I'm not going to let you watch the whole hour service. <laughs> You'll be relieved to know. But I wanted to show you some excerpts from the service. So hopefully you can hear the sound. in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice
costado, no lo podré creer. Ocho días después, los discípulos se habían reunido de nuevo en una casa y esta vez Tomás estaba también. Tenían las puertas cerradas, pero Jesús entró, se puso en medio de ellos y los saludó diciendo, paz a ustedes. Luego dijo a Tomás, mete aquí tu dedo y mira mis manos y trae tu mano y métela en mi costado. No seas incrédulo, cree. Tomás entonces exclamó, mi Señor y mi Dios. Jesús le dijo, ¿crees porque has visto? Dichosos los que creen sin haber visto. Jesús hizo muchas otras señales milagrosas delante de sus discípulos, las cuales no están escritas en este libro. Pero estas se han escrito para que ustedes crean que Jesús es el Mesías, el Hijo de Dios. Y para... I wanted you to sit with that for a while, because it is possible, and I'm sure many of you were um, using your Spanish to um, identify which bit of the Gospels were being read there, but I think to me that was a reflection of what could be possible, along with beautiful choral mu music, which I didn't quite capture because my editing skills aren't brilliant. Um, in there, there, were, there, were, there was the liturgy and choral music and music that reflected the demographic of both the congregants and the local context. So it is possible to do that. It is possible for people to see themselves reflected within a space of worship. But back to the thorny issues of monuments as well. We can't hide from them. We can't hide from what we're being called to look at, to behold and address. And many places are starting to say, what do we do? Because obviously we can't remove them. But what we could do is we can tell the whole story, the full narrative of why they were there, who was impacted, and what then are we being led to do to address the issues that they have caused. I'm pretty amazed that um, our younger people are just curious and wanting to see how we're going to address this. And reparations mean looking at that honestly and not being afraid to talk into those spaces. Howard Thurman writes again, the movement of the Spirit of God in the hearts of men and women often calls them to act against the spirit of their times and causes them to anticipate a spirit which is yet in the making, which is continually in the making, infusing inspiring us to be different, to witness to the glory of what it means to be one body, as it says in Galatians 3.28, to witness as part of our primary call. And I'm not going to preach, although I do feel a preaching tendency coming on here. Um, I'll try not to. In that moment, Thurman reminds us, we're given the wisdom and the courage to dream, to dare for a new possibility, because the possibility doesn't come from us. It is God's possibility of the kingdom. And that is what inspires and kindles hope in those that are around us. That's why it's part of our missional, vocational integrity. I like, I like that. So, The addressing of memorials, the thinking through reparations, which is this, this is just a superficial talk on that, is actually a spiritual issue. It's a personal spiritual issue. It's a communal spiritual issue. It's an organizational and a cultural spiritual issue and needs to be addressed. And some of the addressing of that is through anti-racist practice. It's by ensuring that we as Gide and um, others have said it's by being representative. It's by having those courageous conversations and looking at where our resources come from and where they're going as well, which is really important. 
One church said this, we look at the idea of reparations as a personal spiritual issue. First, we're working on a curriculum that educates both members and those outside it. We look at our money, where it comes from. And where it has come from nefarious sources, particularly sources that have been around the enslavement of others, the subjugation of others, we take steps to address that. We surrender to the vision of God, acknowledging our own proclivities to resist it. And that is an encouragement to me that this is being tackled, but it takes intention to do that. As I come to the end now, I just want to leave you with this. Reparation is part of the work of reconciliation. And Justin Merrick says, tell them that reparation is ultimately redeeming for everyone both those who give and those who received. It is an opportunity for all of us to finally be healed. That healing is ongoing, but we must start it. It is with humility and sincerity that we embark upon it, that road, by acknowledging the sin that divides us but also the hope that unites us. Thank you.